What's up, Degenerate Nation? Welcome to the Big Bets on Campus podcast presented by BetMGM. This is the Week 9 college football betting preview. I'm Stucky, and joining me, as always, is Colin Wilson. Looking a little more optimistic than usual. I think that's because you can avoid pain. Arkansas on a bye. Yeah, not going to lose anybody this week. Arkansas is on a bye. We'll see how the makeshift offensive plan comes together next week. But as for this podcast of week nine, I have a feeling in the air that some, you know, there's going to be some upsets happening that we're not expecting. All right, we will get to, as always, our we're at three marquee matchups this week. We'll get to do a quick rundown, 20 minutes or so, of five or six other games. I have some five or six trash as always. And then we'll go three and out. We'll talk a little Friday night lights, favorite overdogs, underdogs, but let's start with uh, some look ahead or look away. All right. For those unfamiliar or new to the show, welcome. And this is when we just look at the schedule to see if there will be potentially any impact to games this week for based on what happened, you know, either last week or next week. One of the bigger games next week, Washington against USC. Washington will try to remain undefeated and keep their Pac-12, College Football Playoff, and national title hopes intact. Before that, though, Washington will travel to Stanford. Washington is just coming off of a loss, a win where they did not score an offensive touchdown. They barely got out of Dodge in that game against Arizona State. Now they will play a really bad Stanford team that has looked really bad every week except uh, the second half against Colorado. I don't know if Penix is 100% healthy, but if there was ever a game to get right, get back in to that, the high, I mean, he's the second, I think he's the second favorite in the Heisman race now, but to put up some good numbers, this would be the game. I don't know. It's not not a number I'm looking to lay or a game I'm looking to bet. Do you see anything there in Washington at Stanford? Yeah, I do. You kind of mentioned um, the attitude that Washington should have. Like, this should be a get healthy game. And considering they have USC on deck, I would think that the get healthy portion should happen in the first half. And I don't expect a ton of overlook. Like, when you struggle against Arizona State, you need to have a good couple of possessions on offense. There's nothing Stanford can do defensively to stop Washington. They're dead last in havoc, finishing drives, passing down success rate, pressure allowed. I mean, they're terrible across the board. And you mentioned that Arizona State really gave Pennix some problems with cover zero. The Huskies generally average about 5% negative play rate against all coverages. Against cover zero, it's a 17% negative play rate. So that is definitely the way to go to guard them uh, in the secondary. But Stanford has run cover zero on 19 snaps this year. It's just, it's not in their DNA. They just don't have, they don't have the corners to play. They they don't have the corners to do it. They're just not going to be able to get any pressure here. So I took it over 31 in the first half, assuming Washington's going to try to get right here. Question is, do you think Stanford's rushing attack can produce a couple of quality drives? Uh, Ashton Daniels kind of dual threat, 154 rushing yards split between design and scrambles. Stanford runs strictly man and inside zone. And we've said before, Washington struggles against rushing attempts. I I think Stanford could be good for one score in the first half. You're going to make a bet that Washington scores 24 in the first half. I'll say yes. So I'll take the over 31 here. All right, moving on to, we'll talk two games here. Texas, Kansas state next week. That's a big one in the big 12 as it stands right now, Oklahoma, is 4-0 in the Big 12. We'll talk Oklahoma-Kansas later in the show. And then you have a four-way tie for second with Texas, Iowa State, Oklahoma State, and Kansas State. Kansas State has really come on here of late with a dual quarterback system. Your boy has been really explosive, and they've really turned their season around. So is Oklahoma State. We'll talk about them later. And Iowa State has been better than advertised. But let's start with Houston at Kansas State. Can Kansas State avoid a potential look ahead here? How do they match up with Houston? What do you see here? This almost became my overdog for a consecutive week. I mean, Kansas State's on fire right now. I think the question is, is can Dana Holgerson get Houston back on track from an emotional loss against Texas? This is three consecutive emotional games in a row. 
Texas Tech, which everybody says is the new rival for Houston. I mean, with the Mike Leach ties and all of the ties that Dana has to Texas Tech, that was a big game. Then they played West Virginia, Dana's old place of employment. That's a big game. Then Texas, the premier measuring stick for all schools in the state of Texas. I mean, how much do you have left in the tank? And now Kansas State comes in with this inside zone, power pole lead, man, counter concepts. Houston is 111th in defensive stuff rate. Kansas State is going to dominate the line of scrimmage here. They run a ton of inside zone and counter. Avery Johnson didn't have any touchdowns running last week. He had four explosive runs. Um, he had four, five TDs against Texas Tech, but no, none of them last week. He did have two big time throws, recorded his first TD pass. That's only half the equation with Will Howard doing his thing. Houston's 119th in defensive pass EPA. They're 129th in passing down success rate. This is bad. All of this is bad. Even if they can shove Kansas State behind the, those chains, they're going to get, I mean, they're going to get run. The only worry that I have with a number this big for Kansas State is the fact that they run like 31 seconds per play. Like they're so slow. I, to me, it's Kansas State versus the clock to cover this number. Yeah. I mean, I will say this probably comes down to you can throw on Houston. The Houston secondary is terrible. They lost a couple guys to the NFL. You just mentioned their pass defense numbers. You can throw on them. I will say that their rush defense numbers are artificially bad because they had some really, they had a lot of injuries up front, but they got Nwanku Coleman back up front. And over the last two games, their run defense has really held up against Texas and West Virginia as a really good rushing attack. So my only question would be is Kansas State, with Texas on deck, are they going to, and you know, it's a slow methodical team. Are they going to actually want to pass enough to cover this number? Uh, You know, so I actually in this spot with the improvement on Houston's run defense, now that they got healthier up front, I actually would lean Houston with the points, but you're right. They've played and, and look, Donovan Smith's playing a lot better. He was dealing with an injury earlier in the season, but you're right. They played a ton of emotional games in a row. So how much they have left in the tank to go up to Manhattan. It's not a team with a ton of depth. You've seen them wear down at times in the past, in the second halves of games after stretches like this. So nothing there for me, but I I actually would lean Houston at at over 17. The other part of that equation, similar spread, BYU at Texas. Uh, Texas will not have Quinn Ewers at starting quarterback. Instead, they'll go with Malik Murphy. This this BYU team's terrible. I mean, uh, just atrocious. They they you know you go back. They got some. They were lucky against Arkansas. They were lucky against Cincinnati. And it's and by the way, both those teams are what on five game losing streaks. So uh, the first question is, what is the drop off to the quarterback? You know, I, it's a it's a couple points at least. But Malik Murphy's a really talented kid. We just saw BYU on the road, you know, get lose by 33 to TCU's backup quarterback. So, you know, this is an audition for Malik Murphy. He's auditioning for next year in the transfer portal. Um, so after that scare last week, I know they have Kansas State on deck, but I, I cannot get behind BYU. I think you did. You played some BYU early. Uh, I, I, I can't get there. This is Texas or nothing I, for me. I mean, I played BYU on – the second that the AC joint sprain came out for Ewers. And I said, you know, as this gets down, I might come back and cover it up because I think it'll close less than 17, which I'm happy some meatballs that read our app doesn't know that I put in minus seven. I meant minus 17. Good job reading. Um, So, you know, and and the thing is, is I knew that I would come back because I'm not sure how much I believe in Malik Murphy. I'm going to have to do a deep dive on him. There's just not much to go on. I think he's had eight passing attempts this season. And so when you listen to the quotes from Xavier Worthy or some of the other people around the team, it's that Ewers has the touch. Malik Murphy has the fastball. And that's a problem because when you go and look at his throws last week, like (laughs) he's drilling guys eight yards away. Like he throws, he should be a shortstop in Major League Baseball. Guy's got a cannon but he doesn't have any touch. He can throw it that fast when the receiver is the targets, maybe five yards away. So, you know, if you watch the tape of him against rice or in relief against Houston, he's above their heads. He's behind the targets. Uh, inaccuracy was a really big problem. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that's why Quinn Ewers probably won the job over him during the summer. So, but you're right about BYU. They don't create any havoc. 
They don't have any tackling. I think, what are they, dead last in uh, rushing success rate on offense? I mean, they're so bad in so many areas. I mean, 122nd in defensive havoc. Um, they're they're always in passing downs. It's a really tough bet to make. I, I'm still kind of tweening on whether I'm going to buy out of this or not because I'm not sure if I believe in Malik Murphy. Like this, I, I don't. I mean, the he's not an accurate passer, so that makes this kind of a ground game. And then Arch comes in, and you know what are we doing with Arch here? Are we just throwing like crazy against a BYU coverage that's outside the top 100, and hopefully we piece together a 20 point win. I I think the number's too high too. I mean, I make it 14 and a half, so I'm I'm still kind of tweening about what I'm going to do with this game. I have no interest in backing the Mormons now or probably for the rest of the year. All right, but let's before let's get to the marquee matchups, but. Before we do, as a reminder, the BBOC podcast presented by BetMGM. Use bonus code ACTION when signing up to get up to $1,500 paid back in bonus bets if your first bet loses. For new users in Arizona, Colorado, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kentucky, Louisiana, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia, and Wyoming. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 or older. Gambling problem call 1-800-GAMBLER. All right, let's get to the marquee matchups of the weekend. All right, let's start off with let's go to the SEC. There's you know it's not a ton of great marquee matchups this weekend. Fortunately for us betters, that doesn't matter because we'll be spraying the board and sweating all day. But this uh this is definitely one of them. The world's largest cocktail party, 3:30 Eastern on CBS in Jacksonville between Georgia and Florida. This line is Georgia minus 14 and a half, I think, is consensus. We've seen it touch 14 at times. Over under is come down. I think it's sitting at around 48 and a half. Uh, I like I like Florida here. Anything over two touchdowns is fine. I make it right around a, a smidge less than two touchdowns before the Bowers injury. And Bowers is definitely worth, I think, a couple points. They have a really good backup tight end and Oscar Dell, obviously, I mean, it's Georgia. You're going to be able to, but he's not Brock Bowers and Brock Bowers not only had what a quarter of the rece- receptions for the team this year. He's had, I think close to 30% of the touchdowns, the attention that he draws, I think is massive. And it just opens up so many other things for Georgia's offense, both teams coming off of a bye. So what does that mean? All right. Well, Georgia's, uh, Georgia's going to make some adjustments on offense We'll see if they get healthier along the offensive line. We'll see if Mims can play. Their starting right tackle has been banged up, and we'll see if he can go 100% of the snaps and if he's healthy. But what I, you know, you'll see some adjustments from this Georgia offense. But I also think you're going to see some adjustments from this Florida defense. I have a ton of respect for Austin Armstrong. What is his MO? His MO is being super aggressive. He wants to, like, at Southern Miss, and look, we've seen the drop off in the Southern Miss defense. He was had one of the highest blitz rates in all of college football. They're an aggressive defense this year, which is why they allow a ton of explosive plays. But I think they're going to come out here and they're going to run a lot of blitzes, a lot of simulated pressures, and they're going to tr- try to confuse Carson Beck. who's throwing a pick in three straight games. And if you look at Carson Beck, when he's not blitzed, he hasn't been sacked all year. But when he has been blitzed, his pressure to sack rate is close to, I think, 28%. You have to bring bring pressure on. You're going to have to live with some of the explosive plays they're going to hit. They're going to do that anyway. So I think Armstrong is going to be super aggressive here. He's going to force back into a mistake or two. But it's it's really the other side of the ball is that I think Florida – look, Florida's offense has been much better than I had projected and think anyone had projected. I mean, Graham Mertz is completing close to three quarters of his passes. He only has two interceptions, 12 touchdowns. He's been super efficient. and. I think that this offense has found something of late. Um, You know, they, and what I think that they're going to do here, and that's part of what you want to project is I think they're going to go heavy 12 personnel. It's been their best package from a success rate by far. And I think that they're going to, you're going to give ETN the ball a lot. And there's been just, look, if you look at this, this Georgia defense, And their offense, their metrics are all elite. Obviously, they're one of the best teams in the country. But they've played a laughable schedule. I have their schedule ranked outside the top 100. So, you know, the data points haven't been that strong. But I think Florida's best shot at moving the ball is 12 personnel, go heavy, get extra blockers in there, 
while you have still have all of your best skill position players in, that would be ETN, Ricky Pearsall, your best receiver, Arliss Boardingham, your pass catching tight end, who's a stud. He's going to be a player. And then freshman wide receiver Eugene Wilson, who's really come on of late. They've shown it a bit, using him in the running game a little bit. End arounds. I think that they're going to get a little exotic with how they use him. And then Mertz's legs. Like, he can use his legs a little bit. He's not the most mobile. Neither was Peyton Thorne. But these Georgia struggled with any quarterback that can just move, extending drives. But I think the formula here is short, efficient passing, which is what you can do against Georgia. ETN hopefully breaks a couple long runs. But Georgia's shown some cracks compared to usual in the running game. And then take your play-action shots to Pearsall while using Wilson kind of in more exotic ways and then, you know, porting him in the red zone. I think that there's a path here for Florida. This game will also be played at a snail's pace. So, like, trying to cover, two, you know, 14 and a half, asking Georgia to win by margin when they've really only done that once. They've covered one game all year. Why? Part of that is – this team comes out sleepy every week, except for the time that I uh, everyone assumed that they were fired right, between the hedges against Kentucky after an embarrassing performance against Auburn. Other than that, there are other games. There are other games this year. Twenty-four to twenty-four at the end of the first quarter, they've scored twenty-four points. Their opponents have scored twenty-four points. We are talking UT Martin, Ball State, South Carolina, UAB, Auburn, and Vandy. So if Florida, we expect to come out with their hair on fire here, to keep this close early, then it's going to be a game with limited possessions. It's all the same thing with Auburn, Vandy. I think they stay within two touchdowns here. I think they can even give them a scare. And your boy, Billy Napier, he's the dog god. He is 19-6 and six against the spread as an underdog, 76%, covering by over a touchdown per game, 3-0 and against the spread as an underdog against ranked SEC foes during a short time in Gainesville. One of the reasons for that, as you know all too well, he won't stop scoring, and he'll keep <laughs> trying to score at the end. So you better believe if they're down 17, 20, 21 late, old Billy, old sumb up Billy, he's going to still be trying to go for that touchdown to get in the back door. But, uh, yeah, I, I like Florida. I think this is just a, a bit too many points. Until I see otherwise, until like I know it's a slam, like I know George is going to be up here, I assume they're going to come out a little flat. And Florida's not. Florida probably jumps out early. Um, and I think that they can have an, enough success on offense and then create, you know, one or two mistakes from Beck to keep this within two touchdowns. What say you? No one's cost me more money over the years than the head coach of Florida. But uh, I, I like everything you said. I agree with everything you said, except I'm focused more on the total. I love the over is one of the first plays I made. 48 is an extremely key number. I would try to get that at 48. I see it's about split half and half in the market as we're recording this 48 and halves and 48s. And I'll echo a couple of the things you said. The loss of Brock Bowers paves the way for Dominic Lovett. You know, the transfer slot that came in from Missouri last year. I think he's really kind of been a forgotten man in this offense, but he has 30 catches and one TD and he has 1.8 yards per route run. Well, two is really where you need to be the measurement of you're an explosive target or not. People forget that for Missouri, he was 2.9 yards per route run last year. He's an extremely explosive slot target. And I think he picks up a lot of the things, a lot of the routes that Bowers had, especially when they moved from 12 down to 11 formation. The Gators have been fantastic against the rush. They're top 10 in success rate and EPA. And, you know, Florida's not really running the ball because they have injuries no. at the offensive line, running back, their running game has been underwhelming against the against a laughable schedule too yeah and i think that's why uh, you know i to tag on to what you said the, the defensive coordinator austin armstrong he's going to be running heavy blitz multiple personnel i mean they line up in so many different personnels you know nickel dime packages depending on down and distance that i believe it's going to lead to a lot of carson beck passing florida runs a cover three carson beck has had 141 snaps against that above average numbers and success rate and explosives against cover three Beck also in deep passing, passing attempts over 20 yards, nine to one ratio in big time throws versus turnover worthy plays. Now you flip to the other side and you mention this Florida offense and you have to really, uh, the first stat that got me kind of hooked onto them that I think they can score points is that they're 12th in the nation and on target rate on target being does your target, your wide receiver, whatever, do they break stride? Can, do they absolutely not have to do anything when the pass is thrown to them so accurately that they just keep going? 
Graham Mertz is 12th in the nation, but also he's the shortest passer in the nation. Like he has the lowest average depth of target that plays perfectly against the Georgia defense because they play a ton of quarters where it's essentially like man disguised as zone, but it's back off the line of scrimmage against a Georgia defense that only sends three to try to get a, create a pass rush. That's why their pass rush numbers are so low. Cause they Which don't... is huge because Florida's offensive line and pass blocking hasn't been great. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, you know, I think the one place where I would get a little bit nervous if I was backing a Florida ticket is they have one of the longest average distances to go in third down 8.3 yards. So, you know, with an average depth of target for Graham Mertz, it's like 6.57. That's not going to work on third downs. I think that's, you know, but then again, there's a point spread. That's why that's there. But Florida, there's an avenue for Florida to move the ball. There's an avenue for Florida to score points. And if Georgia's sleeping, then they're going to get theirs. And I think Georgia is going to, at some point, turn it on. They're going to be more explosive, more vertical in 11, not 12. So I I like the over here, but 48 is definitely the number. Yeah, someone on on a show that, uh, an appearance that I did. Someone asked me, just say the final score. Guess what the final score would be. And I said 30 to 20, Georgia. Um, so I think Georgia can get to 30. And I, I think um, Florida can get to 17 at least. But I wouldn't be surprised if Georgia got to 35. And I, I think Florida can really get to get three touchdowns here. And there's... Yeah, the only thing I'd be worried about with the over is just the pace, but I do. There are some avenues and for both offenses to hit some explosives, and that's really what you want. Florida's defense has given up a ton of explosives, and that's really what you want when you're betting an over, especially at a key number of 48. But uh, I'm riding with old Sun Belt, Sun Belt Billy. I'm expecting a really solid game plan from Armstrong uh, against Bobo and. Yeah, the numbers for Beck against the Blitz, 25% pressure to sack ratio, two turnover-worthy plays, one big-time throw, A dot drops by about three yards. So, chomp, chomp, let's go Gators, and let's win outright for some chaos, for my Georgia win total under, and to set up a banger on the post-Dan Eno's hogs next week oh my in goodness. the swamp. Wouldn't that be nice? All right. Uh, We're doing I think it. It's gonna be, what's that? We're betting it no matter what. Yes, but that would be the spot of all spots. Uh, so that's what I'm rooting for, for mul- a multitude of reasons. I think it's going to be a fun game, uh, even despite the, the point spread. I think that's going to be – I mean, all these Georgia games have been, except for Kentucky. They've been a little more interesting than many think. All right, let's move on to our second marquee matchup of the day. Let's talk a little Pac-12, Oregon at Utah. Utah's a six-and-a-half-point home dog over under 47 and a half. This game obviously has massive implications. The Pac-12 both teams are sitting at six and one on the season with their one loss coming in conference. This is also an elimination. This is basically an elimination game for the Pac-12 title. This is uh, definitely an elimination game for the college football playoff. And I look, when I look at this game, it's, it's hard for me to project what the Utah offense is going to be because it was so anemic and they haven't gotten Cam rising back or Kuthi, their tight end, but the last two games have been really good, but it was against Cal and USC. I know Vaki who's been amazing moving him from safety to running back. He's provided some juice to the offense, but this is a big step up in class against Oregon's defense. But I, I just, at this number, I can't get to this number. And what did I tell you three weeks ago? I said, when you took you bet UCLA, said just don't don't bet you don't fade Utah at home. It's just not or Whittingham is a dog, and I did that last week. But Utah at home, there is so much voodoo <laughs> in this stadium, and then you have these two forces that are going to meet. Now he's been better this year, but Ro, it's he's still Road Bo Nix. Road Bo Nix meets Rice Eccles voodoo. What's going to happen? What say you? Utah's going to cover this game. And I, I mean, look, this number is way too high. I, I thought it should be three. It opened three. It got blasted up to six, six and a half. And I get it. I get the reason. I think it touched, I, didn't it touch seven? At a one? Yeah, it touched first seven. Time. I grabbed it at seven. I mean, I'm not going to promote everybody to go out and get that because it's not there anymore. But when it once it hits seven, I'm like, come on. This is Rice Eccles. 
This is a team that's having a, you know, a, a cocoon butterfly type metamorphosis into a different offense. And that's why you can't really cite any of the stats that Utah's put up for the season. I mean, they, they, their offense is completely changing with the pig farmer, Bryce Barnes. Uh, you know, I, I guess I'll start with Oregon first. I mean, Bo Nix has a 19 to one TD to INT ratio. He trails Michael Penix by about 400 passing yards. So this is really his shot to get back into the Heisman. If he wins this, I, I was vocal about this on the new BCS and I'll continue to be vocal about it. If Oregon gets through this game, they should be in the Pac-12 championship and they should be contending for a national title. That schedule is conducive to them sweeping out. So we'll see. Both Bucky Irving and Jordan James average at least 7.5 per carry. And, you know, the only place to attack the Morgan Scally 425 defense is with the pass. I don't think Irving and James are going to be that big of a factor in this game because Utah is so good against the run. You're going to have to go up against this pass. It gives up explosives. They're 103rd in defensive pass EPA. Best overall defensive success rate in passing downs, but they're 69th in limiting explosives. So if Bo Nix gets behind the chains, he's going to be able to throw for some chunk yards here. Utah runs a cover one and a cover three. Talked about that exclusively against Caleb Williams, and it showed. But Nix hits a ton of explosives against cover one. Moderate success rate against those, but explosives come against cover one. So I expect to see that. And I think Oregon's going to get stuffed at the line of scrimmage. So that's when you'll see it. Oregon is the top overall offense and on target rate. I mentioned on target before with Graham Mertz, but he throws behind the line of scrimmage so much. Of course, you're going to have a high on target rate. That's not the same for Bo Nix. So Bo Nix has been extremely accurate this year. Now, Utah runs a heavy amount of inside zone on their offense with their 12 personnel. They love to just get you in that phone booth and just box you around. And I mentioned Brian Bryson Barnes, the pig farmer quarterback. I, the fact that was mentioned in the same sense as a Heisman Trophy winner is still the quote of the year. And then defensive back Sione Baki, you mentioned, you know, he <laughs> he's catching balls. He's running balls. He's still playing. Like, we don't know if he's more valuable. He's the true Travis Hunter, right? All the talk coming into the chair is Travis Hunter. It's really Sione Baki. And, you know, running back Jaquindon Jackson and Utah, their top 30 in stuff rate and line yards. I think they're going to have some success running the ball here. Oregon really has issues tackling in space. They're 110th and broken tackles allowed. That means once they get a guy wrapped up, they seem to let him go. So to me, this is a grind of a game. To me, this is a this is a coin flip pick them where I think Utah wins by a field goal or some crazy two-point conversion or a field goal at the last second to win by two. I think this game is dead even. There's way too many points involved in this game. If Oregon wins this, they are in line for the Pac-12 championship and a potential shot at the playoff. Should be interesting to see how Roadbo Nix performs in Rice Eccles. I can't wait to watch that one. Let's talk one final marquee matchup in the ACC. Duke, after that Florida State loss, I mean, they're packed, their ACC hopes, they still have hopes of winning the ACC. They sit at five and two on the season. They will take on Louisville, who also is in that discussion at six and one. From a spot perspective, this is a pretty decent spot for Louisville. They're getting Duke you know, in its second straight road game after Florida State, a game that Duke actually led 20 to 17 before Riley Leonard went out with an injury. Louisville's had two weeks to kind of stew over that pit loss. But I just didn't think Louisville was any good. They were kind of fraudulent all mm-hmm. season. This game is, and look, if you look at Louisville's advanced metrics, one thing that jumps off the page is their explosiveness, like their passing explosiveness. But you're not really going to get a the passing explosiveness against a Mike Elko defense. And that's once again, the case this year with Duke, their secondary has been excellent. You can run on them a bit, but Duar Jordan, his status is uncertain. Louisville's running back. This game is just hard for me to bet because I don't know the status of Riley Leonard. And even if I did, I don't know how healthy he'll be. And his legs are so critical to everything Duke wants to do. Given that uncertainty, given that I, I, you know, think this line is too high based on my projections. Duke's definitely going to make it into the round robin, and they're a good uh, money line underdog shot because of that uncertainty. And I think this this game should be more like a coin flip if, you know, everyone was healthy. What do you see here in a top 20 matchup between Duke and Louisville? Well, let me speak to a bet that we're involved with that's on a larger scale. <clears throat> All we could talk about in the offseason was Louisville's schedule was a joke. And <laughs> we knew that there's a new coach. 
with an old quarterback and they're going to try to make this offense work, but the schedule was so soft. There's no way that this team can't do X, Y, and Z. So Colin went off and took like a flyer on undefeated season. Listen, the big bet that all of us got before the season started was Louisville on the win total. You know, doesn't matter if you got seven and a half, eight, it doesn't matter where that number fell. I think everybody is listening probably got a piece of the Louisville over. This game is paramount to that number. And depending on how much you laid on it, this is an extremely important game. And Stuck's right. I make this game Louisville minus one. That four that you see out in the market, that's reflective of Riley Leonard being doubtful. It's going to move based on what his final status is going to be. You can tell, like, I mean, it. And also, it, but also, as I said before, even if he does play, the, the part of the line is that, like, he might not be able to finish the game. He also might not be 100% mobile. So, like, yeah. that's, that's in, in influencing the line as well. Duke had Florida State up against the wall and until Riley Leonard got hurt and he just could not, you know, even move. I mean, I think he was going to stay on there. As long as he had a pulse, he was going to be out there. That's when Florida State made their roaring comeback and covered the spread. In this game, you have to ask, will Jack Plummer have success throwing against the Duke secondary that's top 10 in coverage? Elko runs a cover three and cover one on 60%. Plummer's over 50% success rate against both of those. He's got a little bit of explosiveness against cover three. So I'm not really worried about those coverage numbers. But offensive finishing drives has been an issue for Louisville all season. They're 84th in the nation. They average 3.6 points on 40 drives that have crossed the opponent 40-yard line. That's just not good enough. All of these numbers inside Louisville make me a little uncomfortable. The fact that they're 129th and passing downs on defense, uh, defending explosives, that's a little scary no matter who we get at quarterback for Duke. So I agree with you, Stuck. This is a round robin play, regardless of Riley Leonard plays. If he doesn't play, I still think it belongs in there. You will definitely see a play come through the app as a hedge to the Louisville win total on the season because they have to have this one if they're going to get over that number. Yeah, big game in the ACC. Florida State sits at 5-0. and You would assume that they end up in the ACC championship. Top two teams go. There are a... Let's see. There are currently four teams with one loss. Virginia Tech, don't see them getting there. Then it comes down to Duke, North Carolina, and Louisville, most likely. Pretty wild looking at Miami 1-2, and two, Clemson 2-3. Two and three. So this game, because you'd have the head-to-head, is pretty much an elimination game for the ACC championship. And then it'll come down to the winner in UNC to see who gets to face Florida State in the ACC championship. All right, let's get to a little rapid fire, hit some of these other interesting games. But before we do, reminder that the NBA season has officially tipped off. So if you like betting the NBA, be sure to check out Buckets, Action Network's basketball betting podcast with new episodes every single weekday this NBA season. That name again is Buckets, available wherever you like to listen. Every day of the season, the season's like 10 months. So yeah, listen, give our, uh, make it worth it for our producers. That's a lot of work. All right, um, let's get to some rapid fire. All right, let's talk, uh, let's go back to the Big 12. Let's talk a little Oklahoma, Kansas. Oklahoma's sitting around the 10-point favorite. It's starting to come down a little bit. And at in Lawrence for homecoming, I, I love Kansas here. Um, I think that this Oklahoma team is still overvalued in the market. They're getting too much credit for that Texas win. Remember, 3-0 turnovers. They had a goal line stand. Texas has the game one if they knew how to manage a clock. Then they play prevent defense. So Oklahoma team's also been extremely fortunate when it comes to turnovers. I think they have plus 10 turnover margin. The rushing attack is broken. They can't run the ball. There's issues on the offensive line. And look, the, their passing game has been great. The schedule's been pretty easy. There's been some misleading scores like the Texas game, the Cincy game. That was like dead even statistically. The SMU game, it's a coin flip with 10 to go. So I, I think this team is overvalued in the market. And they also miss Andrew Anthony, their leading receiver, who's out for the year. You saw that last week against UCF. Um, I don't think Jalen Daniels is going to play. Maybe it's a Troy Calhoun situation. Uh, Maybe he does play. And this is uh, just playing around with Oklahoma and Brett Venables. By the way, Oklahoma's special teams are a disaster. I have them rated outside the top 100 on the season. And guess what Lance Leipold has done in Lawrence? fix the special teams. Remember how disastrous the Kansas special teams used to be? Like they like I would bet them and then they would have they would give up like three punt returns for a touchdown. They would have a punt blocked, uh, missed seven field goals and lose by 50. 
I have their special teams top 10 in the country this year. He's done a tremendous job there. But this is a great spot for Kansas. This is uh, – look, they had a bye. Oklahoma, Oklahoma State on deck. And they – there are certain teams that I value buys for more than others. And Kansas is one because I love their staff so much. I love their head coach. I love their offensive coordinator. Two weeks to prepare. And assuming Daniels doesn't go, Bean, who's played Oklahoma each of the past two years, and they, they put up 42. They lost 52-42 last year in Norman with Bean starting. Two weeks to get him used to the offense, right? He started one game where he learned he was starting that Saturday morning. What does that mean? You're not running with the ones. The game plan's not built for you all week. So you have two weeks to prepare here. This is a guy who's won in the past. You have to attack Oklahoma through the air. Their run defense numbers are legit. And I think that's how Kansas will attack here. A lot of motion. They're a tough team to prepare for, especially with two weeks to prepare. So you can expect some new looks. I think they jump out early on Oklahoma, make this a fight till the end. Oklahoma's going to score. The Kansas defense is bad. Like that. I'm not, not going to sit here and tout the Kansas defense, but I think Kansas can keep up. I think they're going to build a lead early, and then they'll be able to keep up similar to last year in a game that had, what, 94 total points. So uh, I like Kansas here. Get that 10 or better. But let's go rock chalk. Um, what do you what do you got here? Do you agree or disagree? I'm – I hate to say I'm flipping from what I said on the new BCS. Like I, if Jalen Daniels was playing for Kansas, I'd feel much more comfortable laying them. But the fact that it's Jason Bean, you're right. He's playing with the ones now, but it's just, it. it's less explosives. It's less of a threat on the ground. It's less, it's less of everything that Jalen Daniels does. Now, Jason Bean doesn't make a whole bunch of mistakes. He's pretty even on big time throws and turnover worthy plays, but there's just some stats on Kansas that I cannot get over. And, you know, I mean, first off, you know, can they upset them? Oklahoma's won 18 straight. They generally dominate this, you know. Uh, Leipold's had some issues. You know, there's a ton of points scored last year, but they could never keep OU from gaining available yards. And I think that's what this game is. It's an available yards bonanza. And if you don't know what available yards is, like if you line up on the 20, you have 80 possible available yards. I think both these offenses are going to go up and down the field, collecting as many available yards as possible. But KU's 425 defense that runs quarters and cover three, it's been horrific. KU's defense has been obliterated when opponents are in scoring position. They're 124th defensively in finishing drives. They're dead last in red zone efficiency. So I was I was there this week until I found out that all 27 red zone trips by Kansas opponents have ended up being a score. <laughs> it's it's inevitable. Like you get into the red zone, you're getting points. There's no stops coming. So, you know, Dylan Gabriel should have a big day. KU plays quarters coverage. Gabriel's best secondary to attack has always been quarters, a 61% success rate, a 0.24 EPA. So I, I'm switching a little bit just because of the red zone numbers and the finishing drives numbers for Kansas's defense are abominable. I disagree. And I would make the argument that Kansas is due. So look for a Gabriel red zone <laughs> pick and then more missed field goals from their struggling kicker. I can't believe you are two point conversions. Uh, every I time. I can't believe you are you're switching to these Sooners. I don't have a penny um, on it. I haven't made a bet on it, but I, I'm I'm like I'm right there. It's it's at nine. It's like, oh boy. What would Coach Venable say about this? All right, let's move on to the SEC. Kentucky, Tennessee. Kentucky, three and a half point underdog at home in my backyard. I have some people coming into town. Staying with me. Uh, we'll be out for this game. It'll be fun. I love Kentucky here. Um, I think this, number one, this is a phenomenal spot. They're coming off of a bye. I'll mention why that's even more important in a bit. While Tennessee is coming off Texas A&M, emotional win at Alabama, playing for your season, keeping all the hopes alive. Physical game, you're up at the half, and you get demolished in the second half. Now you're playing second straight road game, third straight SEC game. From a rest perspective, from a health perspective, Tennessee's top corner is questionable. Kentucky's going to get a couple starting defenders back. Um, it's all, the edges Kentucky here from a spot perspective. Also, over these two weeks, I know a lot of people close to the program, so I get reports, and they're always honest. Like sometimes it's like this is a disaster. Everything is looking a lot better. Most importantly, well, one with the offensive line getting healthier, but with Leary's mechanical issue and his post-injury apparently like the time off has done 
a lot of good. So we'll see if he can be more accurate. We'll see if they can stop the drops. Uh, because when you know when I look at this matchup, pretty similar teams, right? They both are really good running the ball. They both can stop the run, and neither of them can really pass. You have Joe Milton, the pumpkin. You have Devin Leary, you can't hit the broad side of the barn. I had a, a friend who's a photographer. She got hit in the head with a ball uh, that Leary misfired. So, you know, these are really similar profile teams. I make this closer to a pick. I love the spot for Kentucky. I'm hearing really good reports about the offensive line, Leary, some of the things they've been working on over the past two weeks. Um, so, and look, Tennessee, while their run defense has been good, they're outside the top 100 in rush explosiveness. What does that mean? Ray Davis is probably going to hit one or two big throws here. And how do you move the ball against Kentucky? You you can throw it on them, right? Their defense has been great all year. And then what did Missouri do? They threw all over them. Georgia threw all over them. I don't trust Joe Milton to methodically move the ball down the field. He's had one good half all year. He is not accurate enough to do that. Um, and they're not. And Kentucky doesn't allow explosives. Still, that's uh, uh, that's just a staple of their defense. So, and look, the Tennessee rushing offense with Wright, Small, and Sampson has been really good. They're averaging six yards per carry over 200 attempts. But they're only two road games against two other strong rundies. 46 rushes, 172 yards. That's 3.7 yards per carry. Their overall season average, top five. That in those two games would be outside the top 100. So I I really like this matchup. I really like some of the things I'm hearing about Kentucky. I think this offense is going to have some more juice, and especially early on, you can expect some new wrinkles. And uh, with the spot and matchup, I have to take over a field goal here for what it's worth. Mark Stoops, 2011 and one against the spread against ranked opponents, including eight and one as a favorite or underdog of a touchdown or less. Give me the cats here to get back on track against a Tennessee team that I haven't believed in all year. And outside of their home stadium this year, they were blown out to pieces by Florida and then were outscored 27, nothing in the second half by Alabama. Give me Kentucky here. You and I are going to go at it this weekend. Uh, you're on Tennessee. I like Tennessee in this game, but oh I God. again, I haven't made a bet. I want three. I'm not going to get three. It looks like it, it's either going to stick at three and a half or go the other way. Oh uh, my God. I know. I know. Tennessee like, that you're backing Tennessee and Oklahoma. These two teams that we God. have been fading and said are fadable. I know. Well, I mean, the Tennessee fans should be happy, right? I mean, after all that summer stuff about how, I don't know how the hell you get over your win total. Um, They'll be happy that I'm going to, I think I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to play them here. I just don't know how I'm going to play them. So listen, we're not a trends podcast as a, a, a competitive podcast that they, they make all their bets on trends. It's ridiculous. But one that really popped into my mind was what Stoops is off of buy, because it, it, it just feels like that's stuck in my head. So I went and looked it up. He's covered five of 17 games after a buy since 2017. It just, there are some coaches that utilize buys differently, whether it's relaxed or structured, Andy Reid, Mark Stoops, whatever, right? Uh, Kentucky's not been good after a bye week since 2015. And that's, I mean, that's been going on forever. And so when I think about that, you know, I'm not going to dive into what Kentucky's doing in their free time. But when I look at the X's and O's in this, can the Tennessee defense contain Kentucky's one big thing that they do on offense, which is ground explosives with Ray Davis? I think the answer is yes. I mean, the volunteers are sixth in rush EPA allowed. They're top 35 in stuff rate. They're 11th in line yards. Doesn't, I mean, their strength of schedule is 22nd, it's top 25. I mean, that would make me think that they're going to be able to stop the one thing that the offense can do. Now, if Devin Leary just pops up and it's like the best version of him, I can't handicap that. I haven't seen it all year. Been really bad reports about the torn peck and all that good stuff. So, I mean, if that happens, fine, take my money because I haven't seen it all year. But the question that I also have, because I'm not a Joe Milton fan, never have been, scared the shit out of me in the first half against Alabama, threading some of those throws and running. When did Jill, Jill, Joe Milton become a runner? But the question is, can he have success throwing against the Kentucky defense? Kentucky's defense is 70th in defending pass explosives. They're 58th in coverage. So nothing spectacular here. And Kentucky's strength of schedule is 60th, much lower than Tennessee's. Kentucky plays exclusively in cover three. Milton has had a career average success rate in EPA against cover three. He really thrives in cover one, but he's not going to get it here. He's going to get cover three. So Tennessee covering the three and a half, I'm waiting for a three, but 
more important, I think this is going to be a first half bet, like a first half money line bet for me, a little bit juiced. Um, because if Kentucky can't get it together after a bye week, which historically they can't, and Tennessee is going to show up because of what happened against Alabama, first half is the way to play. So I haven't made a decision yet where I'm going. If I get a three, I'll play the full game. If not, I'm going to go first half. I will be ready to fire Milton pictures to you when Kentucky my, my Twitter will be ready for you. If I when I make the bet and put the money down, I'll be ready for you. Uh let's go to the Big Ten Ohio State at Wisconsin. I don't really have a strong feel here. Basically it comes down to how many times can Kyle McCord stare at and hit Marvin Harrison, basically, which is the Ohio State offense. They can't really <laughs> run the ball, but their defense should shut down Wisconsin. Uh, 14 and a half point favorite here over under 45 and a half, maybe a little Ohio state hangover after that Penn state win. I don't really have any interest here. I think I saw you bet Wisconsin. I think yeah. I saw that come through in the app. What's your case here? I may get 12. Uh, I think 14 and a half is too high. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of optimism with Ohio state for Trevion Henderson, like Buka Denzel Burke's going to be back on defense, but you know, one of the places that Ohio state struggles is in the red zone and Devin Brown is out. It takes away some of the red zone packages. So they're going to have to find a way to score points when they get closer to the goal line. The numbers are pretty similar from a rushing perspective with these two teams. When, when Ohio State's running the ball with line yard stuff rate, success rate, they have the same strength of schedule, same metrics. So I'm not sure Ohio State's going to have a lot of success running the ball here. At least the numbers say that they won't. They run outside zone twice as much as they do inside zone. Wisconsin is national average and, and really good at defending inside, inside zone and outside zone success rate from an EPA level. So Kyle McCord is going to have to take the air here because I don't think Ohio State is going to be able to generate enough of a rush to get them a lot of first downs. That's where the Wisconsin defense thrives. They run, they run a ton of cover one, and, and they're better in, in uh, secondary coverage than they are against the rush. And McCord's average success rate and low EPA against cover one this season. So that's an advantage for Wisconsin on that side of the ball. When you go to the other side, uh, you know, the Braden Lock. <laughs> I mean, Braden Lockett is uh, a little bit tough to diagnose. He's had four turnover-worthy plays and an INT against Iowa, two TDs against Illinois last week. And Illinois runs exclusively cover one. That's what Ohio State runs. So Braden Lock had a lot of success against the Illinois secondary, running the same coverage that Ohio State runs. But with Denzel Burke back, it's a pretty huge get. Neither of these teams, and, and I think this is why I got on Wisconsin, neither of these teams have the explosiveness to blow out the other. They just, Ohio State's offense hasn't shown it. Wisconsin definitely doesn't have it. Both of the defenses have the edge and quality and finishing drives. So that leads me to believe this is game is going to be more of a grind and you know, I'm going to take 14 and a half points in a game like that. So hopefully it's scary and Ohio state trips up and all the things that we predicted about them happens, but it, it there's just not enough explosiveness from Ohio state for me to believe that they can blow Wisconsin out on the road. Yeah. I, I mean, if I had a bet, I would be Wisconsin or nothing. Um, moving on to the, Segment of the show everyone's been waiting for, the free money Colin Fade of his bet on the UCLA game. UCLA, 17.5 point favorite at home against Colorado, coming off of a bye over under 62.5. Quarterback uncertainty for UCLA. I know you like the back UCLA when Dante Moore starts, when they don't cover, and then fade them when Dante Moore doesn't start, when they do cover. So what do you see here? Well, I mean, you're not going to get anything out of Chip Kelly about who's playing here. He just – Colin Schley's healthy. That doesn't mean he's going to play. Ethan Garbers, we don't know. I mean, it's just – you're never going to be able to figure out who's playing quarterback here. This is such a huge mismatch here. I mean, the Colorado offensive line is allowing – has allowed 122 pressures this season. The Murphy Twins and Latu Latu lining up on the UCLA defensive line, it's, it's going to be bad. Shadur Sanders is going to be on the run. It doesn't mean that he can't make plays, but he's going to be flushed out of the pocket on every single run. Colorado can't run the ball. So look for that there on that side of the ball. But with Dante Moore, is he going to throw another pick six? This cost me so much money this year. He's got four INTs and clean dropbacks. He's got three INTs and pressured pockets. It doesn't matter if he's pressured or not. He's just throwing these interceptions like crazy. So Moore has struggled with cover three and Colorado plays cover three, but they have very low marks and success rate in EPA. They're not good in coverage at all. Colorado's 92nd on target allowed. Remember I mentioned on target is does your target, does your wide receiver have to change his course or move his body? And the answer is no, Colorado doesn't force any wide receiver to change. Uh, they don't play coverage well enough to make any wide receiver sweat or have to change his, his steps. So the key stat in this game 
is UCLA being 17th in pass explosives and Colorado being 126th in defending it. We can say everything we want about Dante Moore throwing pick sixes. He throws a beautiful deep ball. He's had nine big time throws to one turnover worthy play on throws that are uh, over 20 yards. They're like the anti Penn state, right? He's terrible on zero to 10. He's great out over 20 yards. So with Colorado and UCLA running like 22, 23 seconds per play, a healthy amount of possessions here. I don't want to touch this 17 because it's got backdoor written all over it. I mean, if Colorado's trailing by 31, do I think they can come back and score two TDs late? Yeah, I absolutely do think that they could do that. So what I played was UCLA over 40 and a half on their team total because every game Colorado is in is a shootout. And you're going to give me two offenses that run 23 seconds per play or less and a Colorado defense that can't defend explosives. I'll take UCLA to get to 41 points. Not right, heard it here first. UCLA team total under is the play. All right. Uh, let's stay in the Pac-12 for the last rapid fire. Uh, maybe you disagree with me again here because I'm going against my boys in Oregon State. Uh, this line just hit three everywhere. I think it's going to keep going down. Uh, Arizona is good. I don't know why the market doesn't understand it. This team uh, should be six and one. They lost to USC in quadruple overtime. They lost to Mississippi State due to turnover luck in overtime. And their other loss came by seven points against Washington. Noah Fafita is the truth. He is, look at his numbers. He started three games against top 20 opponents. He's 12th in QBR. He's completing over 75% of his passes. And he just has a better command of the offense, makes fewer turnover-worthy throws than Delora. I, I hope that it's Fafita. I hope that it's Fafita moving forward. And this Oregon State team is just not the same away from Corvallis. They played, what, two Pac-12 road games? They gave up 40 and 38. They've also played, what, three straight freshman quarterbacks, like making their first start. Uh, it, it's it's not been that aren't they aren't even the starting quarterbacks anymore. I mean, they face Noah Johnson in Utah. Um, they face the the freshman in Cal. I mean, it's been, it's been a very easy schedule for Oregon State. And this Arizona offense, I mean, they have great receivers. The feed is playing well. But it's a very balanced offense, and they can run the ball as well. Oregon State, not only are they vulnerable in the secondary, I mean, they're bottom 15 in rush success rate allowed. Uh, this is a deep r- rushing attack for Arizona. Arizona's going to move the ball at will here. And on the other side, the Arizona defense is underrated. Like the Arizona defense is better than the Oregon State defense. And they've been decent against the run, which is what Oregon State wants to do. I, I mean, look, this is this Arizona's winning this game. I'm sorry. Uh, it's going to hurt my Oregon State futures. But and at least it's going to be really close. I think it comes down to a field goal at the end. But uh, I like Arizona. I haven't been trying to get in front of Arizona all year. I mean, they've been hot. Jed Fish, I think, is not long for the job at Arizona because I think an SEC team can come in and scoop him up. I mean, he – I really hadn't spent any time, you know, listening to Jed Fish until I got to Pac-12 Media Days, cash your tickets, and he commands a room. Um, so I, it's just amazing to me what he's done with this program. Now, the key stat in this game, because I was really debating it like two and a half of my buying Oregon State. Arizona is top 10 in defensive stuff rate. What? <laughs> yeah. I mean, good against the run. Yeah. What 13th in defensive line yards. And by the way, Stuck mentions like Oregon State schedules, eh, you know, 93rd in strength of schedule, Arizona 53rd. So, yeah. And Oregon State, uh, some of those teams, like they faced quarterbacks who are no longer starting. Like, yeah. Like, like, like look when they faced Utah. Um, there's two, there's two other stats that come out of Sports Info Solutions that like really, favor Arizona here one of them is I've talked about it almost with every game on target rate how good are you at throwing the ball no matter who the quarterback has been Arizona has been top 10 and on target rate Oregon State is 89th and defensively and on target rate they're not very good in coverage the the one stat that really caught my eye is that Arizona's fifth in the nation in broken tackles they create a lot of broken tackles and Oregon State is horrible 131st and broken tackles allowed on defense. I, I agree with you here. I haven't put any money on it. I was kind of thinking maybe it gets too low. I'll take Oregon State, but man, you you put these numbers up against each other. Wildcats are they're on fire. Jed Fish is going to be in the SEC or he's going to be in a high profile job coming up soon. Bear down. If they only won that USC game, they went for two, and then they should have beat Mississippi State. They'd be in the mix for getting to the Pac-12 championship. This team is good, people. Before we get to some trash, quick reminder to make sure you check out the group of five guys, Mike Calabrese and Mike Ionel, Mike and Mike, on the group of five deep dive. 
every Wednesday morning here on BBOC, talking all things Group of Five. I think they like some San Jose State and New Mexico this week. They crushed it last week. Hopefully they can keep it rolling, but they always do a good job getting ready for the Group of Five. All right, let's move on to some trash. Uh, it's not the most uh, – If some people probably are going to exhale. I don't have a ton of the worst possible trash here. I think I will next week looking at the schedule based on some of my projections, but we'll see. Um, we'll see what next week brings us. But let's start with – let's go to Cincy. Uh, this is – this line has gotten too high. This is your buy low, sell high spot of the week. Um, now that it hits seven, above seven. Look, Oklahoma State's won three straight, all as underdogs. And Cincinnati's lost five straight. So, I, And I think this represents the bottom of the market on Cincy, the top of Oklahoma State. Oklahoma State also has Oklahoma next week. This is a potential sleepy look at spot. But let's dig into what's happened with Oklahoma State. You know, well, after the bye, they did stick with one quarterback. They changed their running scheme, and they're feeding Ollie Gordon, who's ran it. Uh, he's averaged 7.3 yards per carry over the last four games. Over the first three games, they only gave it to him 19 times total. Offense is a lot better. Defense is still bad. I mean, over the, during their winning streak, they're averaging like 483 yards. They're giving up 450. O over the, During their winning streak, their three-game winning streak, they've gotten extremely lucky. Um, you know, their opponents have gone one of eight on fourth down, set up a lot of short fields. They've had a, a plus four turnover margin, including a huge pick six. The opposite's true for Cincy. There, there's been some struggles for Cincy, but they haven't, it hasn't been bad as, as it looks. They were de definitely outplayed by Iowa State, but look at their other four losses. Outgained BYU by 250 yards in an eight-point loss due to a pick six. Outgained Miami of Ohio by over 200 yards, lost in overtime. Uh, Oklahoma only had 50 more yards in a 14-point loss. They outgained Baylor, 450 to 396, three-point loss. There was a fumbled kickoff for a touchdown by Baylor. So during their five-game losing streak, they've only forced three turnovers. They gave it away nine times, negative six margin. They've had two massive game-swinging defensive touchdowns allowed. And they are they just shoot themselves in the foot in the red zone. So this is a good buy-low spot on Cincy. From a matchup perspective, both defenses allow a ton of explosiveness. So this could turn into a bit of a shootout. But Oklahoma State's passing attack is bottom five in passing explosiveness. That's probably that's welcome news for Cincy's secondary. That's allowing way too many explosives. And Cincy's run D's been really good. That's been the strength of the team. That's huge against Gordon. So uh, I will say, if you want to want a trend to back this up, the week after winning outright as an underdog, teams on a three-game winning and covering streak, Six and twenty-two against the spread when they're favored by a touchdown or more over the past twenty years, twenty-one percent. That just signifies, you know, you, you could data mine all you want, but basically what that's saying is, team has just won it outright as an underdog. They've covered and won three straight. Pretty good chance they're probably going to be at the top of the market. And I think in this case, you also have another team at the bottom of the market that you're buying low on. It's too many points here. Oklahoma State loves gone too far. Since you hate has uh, gone too far as well. So give me the Bearcats. Agree or disagree? Uh, I'm going to watch from afar and support you. Probably be jealous if you cash this ticket. I mean, Cincinnati has great rush defense numbers. Uh, 15th in line yards, 22nd in rushing success rate on the defensive side. This team scares us. I mean, I've lost so much money on Cincy this year because of these mental mistakes, the penalties and the turnovers that happen in the most critical parts of the game. I think it's a Scott Satterfield trade of the teams that he coaches. I mean, I'm with you. I'm behind you. There's no way I would bet Oklahoma State here. But at the same time, if you're rolling with Sensi, man, boy, the mistakes have just been killer this year. Next trash, we're going to go with Purdue. Boiler up, 2-5 and five, Purdue. You might look on the surface and say, oh, 4-3 and three, Nebraska's only laying under a field goal at home against Purdue. Uh, this is my favorite bet of the weekend. I've been waiting on the three to come. I'll still play the two and a half. I'll play money line. They'll be in my round robin. Yes, Purdue's two and five. They've had some misleading box scores. They've been a bit unlucky in a number of areas, but they've also played one of the top 10 most difficult schedules in the country this year. Meanwhile, Nebraska's right around national average. So the Purdue's played a ridiculous schedule. They're also coming off a bye here. I really like their staff, but most importantly, this Nebraska team is done. Uh, they have no players left. Uh, last, last, they've already lost. Two of their receivers in Castaneda and Mar Marcus Washington early in the season. They lost their two running backs in Irvin Jr. and Ramir Johnson to season-ending injuries. 
Last week, they lost their top three offensive linemen who will not play this week, who had a combined 78 career starts. And they lost their leading receiver, Billy Kemp, who's now out again. I, they got they have nothing left on offense. Matt Rule said he's never seen an injury situation worse than this. Uh, from a matchup perspective, too, Nebraska can't throw the ball. They have one of the nation's least efficient passing attacks, so you can't take advantage of Purdue's secondary. Purdue can just load the box here, take away the run, take advantage of an offensive line that's – and by the way, because of all these injuries, they're going to have true freshmen in there, that offensive line. They don't want to burn red shirts. So like, it's it's a mess. This Nebraska offense is a mess, and the Cornhuskers' defense has been so good against the run, a little worse against the pass, but your run defense is meaningless here against Purdue. It just wants to throw the ball uh, with Hudson Card. So – yeah, this is all Purdue all the time. Nebraska is decimated by injuries. I think Purdue should be favored here. Boiler up. Yeah, I'm uh, not going to play this with you because I have a Nebraska under six uh, win total here. I did four wins. I desperately need a loss, so I'm going to back you here. Uh, this These Nebraska numbers are horrid, putrid. Now they have injuries, and they've played a soft strength of schedule when you compare it to Purdue. So I am with you all the way here. I need a victory out of Purdue for a season-long win total bet. And let's go back to the great state of Arizona, the Copper State, I think it is. Uh, we're going to Arizona State here against Washington State. I, I, any, I don't care, anything over a field goal. Uh, but I think it's sitting at six, five and a half, maybe. It's coming down, as it should. If it's not broken, don't fix it. We're going back to this Arizona State team. Been riding them all Pac-12. Play. They've covered every game. This team is so undervalued in the market because the first three games of the year, they were a disaster because they had so many injuries. They also have been the unluckiest team in the nation in turnovers, unluckiest in field position, and unluckiest in injuries. Now they're healthy. This defense is balling out. Uh, and look, who's the defensive coordinator? Brian Ward. Where'd he come from? Washington State. He knows Cam Ward as well as anyone. He's going to bring a ton of pressure, and that's how you fluster Cam Ward. I He had this, the familiar, film, familiarity excuse me, here favors Arizona State. They have so much positive aggression coming their way as well. This Arizona State team, I think, is the most underrated team in the country, and it remains so. Even they should have beat Washington outright in Seattle, uh, the, a team that was just scoring at will against Oregon. This defense ranks in the top 10 nationally in EPA per pass and overall explosiveness allowed. What does Washington do? They only throw the ball, they only want to push the ball downfield. They're 30th, top 30 in explosiveness. They're going up. It's the Sun Devils defense. Their secondary is balling out and healthy. They're going to bring a ton of pressure. Ward's going to make some mistakes here. And on the other side of the ball, Arizona State, they finally found their quarterback in Bourget, but they're going to have success running the ball here. Scadabo uh, is going to run wild against this Washington State defense that has no linebackers. Their linebacker, they lost them all during the offseason outside the top 100 and rush success rate. Um, this is a great matchup. Brian Ward's familiarity will play large. It's the desert, baby. Sun Devils 46 31 and 3 against the spread at home in league games since 2005, 60%. Uh, Sun Devils, uh, forks up, baby. We're going right back to the well. Yeah, I mean, the Washington State team was a bit of a mirage the first half of the season because I was asking how the hell did Cam Ward all of a sudden decide to stop turning over the ball, right? I mean, he was good for four turnovers and six turnover-worthy plays through all of his games through his entire career, even at Incarnate Word. So then you focus on this game. Let me ask you a question. We'll end the handicap here. What rank do you think Arizona State is and pressures created on defense? Uh, eighth. Third. Take Arizona yep. State. Sun Devils. Forks up, baby. Uh, that's my squad. Um, that should be the helmet, right? Yeah. Do people watch that? I see it. I see it. Gotta get you have to, the fork is like the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. I, that is yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna get helmet. that. I'm gonna get one if they cover this week. I'm buying one. <laughs> okay. All right. Um. Uh. Cal USC. I, I, I'm not gonna go too deep into this. I'm betting Cal. I'm fading USC. I don't. Uh, this team's a fraud. They shouldn't be favored against anybody. Uh. Laying double digits. I don't. I don't. Their defense sucks. Cal score enough some way. I don't <laughs> care as a quarterback. I don't know where USC is mentally. They could be completely checked out. Wouldn't be surprised if Cal wins this game. I'm taking the points. I could go into more of a breakdown, but uh, it's, I'm fading USC. I don't know. This is a nut check game for USC. Are you still in the season? Um, technically, you no, could... they're not. What were they playing? They were playing I, I know, for I know. Now they have nothing to play for. 
I mean, I was blowing out of a fucking bullhorn last week saying they're checked out. And that was when they were undefeated in conference. So I guess I don't know why that would change now. So yeah, I'll ride with you on Cal. I haven't put any money on this game, but I said USC was checked out last week. I, there should be really checked out now. Yeah. Uh, last one, just quick. I haven't bet this one yet. Thinking about it, Georgia Tech plus 11 against UNC. Talk about a team that might not show up here in UNC yep. after that devastating loss. You have Campbell on deck. I could see them being sleepy. Georgia Tech has responded well in recent years to bad losses. They had one of their own last week against BC. UNC's defense, should they really be laying 11 and a half here? The last two years, Georgia Tech's been like 20 and 18 point dogs and one outright against UNC, I think. Uh, it's ramble and record, nothing here. UNC could be super fragile. This was going to be the underdog entry for our for our parlay. It was that it was this or the one that I was going to take down low. I mean, they're both. I had a really hard time finding an underdog uh, underneath a TD, but I really like this one a lot. And when you go and look at North Carolina, when they lose games, they lose them in bunches. Last year, they lost four straight to end the season. One of those losses was to Georgia Tech. So, uh, you know, this is just, it's the nature of this game. But when you go into the coverages, Drake May struggles with the coverage that Georgia Tech plays. I like the Yellow Jackets here with you. Yeah, they'll be in my round robin. So yep, I agree. Uh, they're a good round robin piece. All right. Uh, that'll do it for trash. Georgia Tech, Rambo and Rec, Cal, fuck USC. Arizona <laughs> State forks up. Purdue, too many Nebraska injuries. And we're buying low on Cincy. All right. Uh, no Aztec overs or unders. You've been hot on those, but they have a buy. And no Colin on Arkansas because they have a buy. Um, yeah. So light work for you this week. Let's get to three and out. All right. Before we get out of here, let's go three and out. Let's start with some Friday Night Lights. Gross. We need midweek match that goes back next week. By the way, my mid my Mac Manifesto will be out early next week. We need it because these games. Why? Why are they? I guess because there's World Series. Yeah, watch the World Series, but Florida Atlantic at Charlotte. Uh, gross. What do Charlotte could win that game. Yeah. Are you, are you back in Charlotte? Yeah, I got to put money down on it. I knew I was going to put money on Biff when they turned the corner. They finally turned the corner. I mean, be it what it is, a victory over East Carolina, but, uh, you know, I mean, Florida Atlantic hasn't, I mean, they haven't done anything special either. So, all right, riding with Biff on Friday Night Lights. Let's go to second down our favorite overdog for those new to the show. That's our favorite favorite. Uh, I'll kick things off. I'm going to go Boise State here. Anything under six is fine. Uh, know some people close to the program getting good reports about what's going on there after their really bad loss. And if you talk about a team that's responded well to bad losses in recent years, Boise State has done that. So I will give them credit in that aspect. But they're getting healthier. That's the biggest thing here. Look, they're going to have their full offensive line together for the first time since full camp. You're going to get George Halani back, who's just going to be a nice little counter to Ashton Gentry, who's arguably the best running back in the country. So, and they, they just don't have any depth there. They just have a guy who, like, you know, it's like me in high school. You just try to hold onto the ball and move forward for a yard. They have no no depth, but Halani and Gentry now back. Uh, and this Wyoming team, I mean, look, they have they beat New Mexico and Portland State by nine and fourteen. Their three other victories came by a combined 10 points with the help of turnovers, special teams, touchdowns, and opposing quarterback injuries. Like they've, they've not been that great. Um, so I'm buying low on Boise State here. They're getting healthier on both sides of the ball. The biggest weakness on Boise is their secondary. They can't cover anyone. Wyoming's not going to really exploit that. Boise's also do a few bounces. I mean, they're the complete opposite end of the spectrum of Wyoming. Um, they You have a very similar schedule difficulty. Broncos – Negative five turnover margin, Pokes plus five, and some of the Boise losses. I mean, they lost on a last second field goal. They lost on a last second Hail Mary. They lost on a blocked field goal touchdown uh, against Memphis by three. So I, this is Boise here. I think this is a great spot to back the favorite and fade the Pokes away from Laradice. What do you got? Breaks my heart. I got some Wyoming futures, 13 to one. That's a must win game and they're going to lose it. And it's going to break my heart. Uh, I'm going to go two lane on my overdog. I think minus 10 and a half minus 10 is out there right now. Um, going up against rice. And really this is two different offenses, two lane being ground based rice being passing based. And you just have to handicap which defense is going to have better success. And two lane is going to have much more success throwing down 
some coverage unit against JT Daniels. They're going to be able to limit him uh, in the cover one that they play. JT Daniels, uh, he's average success rate, average in explosives, but he has a large negative play rate when going up against cover one. Tulane's going to be able to implement that uh, and kind of stifle them a little bit. But really, the handicap comes down to what Tulane does on the ground, inside zone, outside zone, man concepts, counter. Uh, they do so much pre-snap and during it. Uh, I mean, it's just really hard to keep track of. And Rice has been absolutely horrific against inside, outside zone, and even worse against counter. So uh, this is a thing where Rice does not have it in the front seven to stop what Tulane does with so many, you know, 12 formations and motion and tight ends and, and, and with the running of um, Malachi, uh, Malachi Hughes and, uh, and, and Michael Pratt. So I expect them to eat a bunch of clock to have tons of explosive gains on the ground covering that 10 and a half. All right. Good stuff there. So Boise and Tulane as our favorite overdogs. One final test before we get out of your third down, <laughs> our favorite money line underdogs. I'll be quick. I'll give a reasonable take. I'm going to go with Purdue. I already talked about this game earlier. Uh, injuries for Nebraska are devastating. Lost their three top offensive linemen last week. Lost their leading receiver. They already lost two receivers and two running backs during the season. Rule said it's the worst it's ever been. Purdue off of a bye. Great matchup on both sides of the ball. Nebraska can't take advantage of Purdue's secondary. Purdue can load the box here. I just I don't see it. Nebraska's biggest strength is the run defense on D. Purdue doesn't run the ball. This is a great matchup. Great spot. Too many injuries for Nebraska. Purdue gets it done. Now I'm going to get out of the way. For your money on underdog, I should just put this, put this up here. I, 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 apparently, I mean, when people open up the article, on it Ash- turns out this is the trash segment, by the way, right now. Uh, yeah, but I, I said this isn't really the trash. This is more of the city dump, right? I think we're just completely bypassing the bin that's next to your desk. We're going to the city dump. And I'm not going to sit here and make a bunch of reasons why I think Southern Miss is good, right? Southern Miss, Will Hall, I think Will Hall is probably done. His time is done. He's still coaching like he's going to be there. Um, they are what you and I call a corpse. Their season is pretty much over one and six. They don't have a FBS win. They've beaten Alcorn state. Um, but they do have one redeeming quality. They run the ball with Frank Gore. They actually do have some semblance of a ground game. They have a tougher strength of schedule. They've played, you know, well on the ground running the ball. Frank Gore, like I said, still there. Uh, but really the handicap is app state. They have been horrendous for a month. They've lost three of their last four. The one game that they did win was against ULM on a last second 55-yard field goal. They were 14-point favorites. They needed a 55-yard field goal to win that game against ULM. They lost to Old Dominion last week. They are horrific. They're terrible. And more importantly, they're terrible against the run. Um, And so, you know, ULM, they average more than five yards per carry. That's really bad for App State. I don't know what has happened to them. Uh, against the run, they're 129th in tackling. They're just everything from rushing success, line yards, EPA. They're 119th in allowing rush explosives. Can Southern Miss take advantage of this? I mean, they're 45th in rush explosives. It's really the only thing that they kind of have to live on. But I can't even talk about how far App State has fallen off the track of who they used to be. And so Frank Gore, you know, I, he's created 27 missed tackles. Southern Miss is 23rd nationally in creating broken tackles on the ground. I mean, listen, the number should be like nine. It shouldn't be 17. Why am I bringing it to the table here? Because App State's losing to Old Dominion and they needed a 55-yard field goal to beat ULM. It can happen. It can happen. Uh, You're bringing the trash here this week. Uh, Look, I will say you want some variance with these big dogs. Will Hall said he's reevaluating everything. Everything. So you could see some new... Frank Gore playing quarterback. Yeah. Uh, Bring back the Wildcat. That's been... Southern Miss has been the best. So you got to hope for uh, Frank Gore to go wild. I, I mean, that's a 17 point dog. It's not my least favorite one. If it goes, I mean, there were others on the board, uh, you know, I mean, like I did like Georgia tech stick uh, with it. Don't go, don't go to your backups. All right. But, but Southern listen, Miss. listen, it's Southern Miss. And I promise boys. this. I promise this. If it, if it doesn't, if it doesn't cover, if it doesn't win, We'll be right back with something really short next week, and I'll let you take the the TD 10-point type underdog here. I wanted to really go out on a limb here. All right. A fitting way to end. My trash wasn't as trashy as usual, so we had to get some trash, <laughs> some real trash in there. But thanks, as always, to Colin for joining me. Thanks, of course, to our producer, Matt Mitchell, on the back end. 
thanks to our video team and social as well. But most importantly, thanks to all of you for tuning in. We're up over 300 episodes now. Make sure you subscribe, unsubscribe, subscribe, leave a review. Tell a friend, tell an enemy. Five-star review. They really help us out. We'll do some more giveaways on Sunday. Don't forget about the voicemail, 959-BAD-BEAT. It's always in my X or Twitter profile. Call in, bitch, cry, moan, whatever you need to get off your chest. It's therapeutic. And we'll play the best ones on our recap show, which will be out on by Monday morning with a quick look ahead to next week. One final reminder, make sure you check out the group of five guys. And then we'll be back 10.30 a.m. Eastern live for BBOC live Saturday morning. I'll tweet out that link. That'll be in the award-winning Action Network app and on YouTube as well. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you hit that subscribe button and like this video. I know you're not, so please just do. Thanks for tuning in. Good luck on all of your wages. Let's have another big weekend. Keep it rolling here. We'll catch you all on Saturday. Cheers. Peace out.